Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. I, as always, I'm your host Simon, I'm here, one of my writers. This case, Ilza, thank you Ilza, has written me a script, Who Were the Sea Peoples? Keeping it simple with that title. Are these the people who, like, randomly arrived in the Mediterranean, like, wiped out civilizations or something? That's literally all I know about this, even though I'm pretty sure that I must have touched on this in videos in the past because it's like super famous. But anyway, the point of the show, if you're brand new here, is I'm going to read this script. I've never read it before. You and I, dear audience member, are going to learn something together. Let's go. On a bright, clear morning, a couple of thousand years ago, a young man strolling along the beach looked out over the deep blue ocean and his breath caught in his throat. He almost collapsed to his knees, but the thought of his beautiful wife and the happy cries of his newborn son gave him wings. His heart pounding, he fled to report a sight that left him in a cold sweat, praying to gods he never believed in, as many a desperate man had done before. Leaning against the doorpost, trembling in fear, he managed to stammer out the dreaded news. They are here. The feared sea people. The scourge of the Mediterranean, who had left every port they visited in flame and ruin, had finally arrived. Yeah, it's like, what's that famous quote? Like, everyone's an atheist until they're, like, on their deathbed <laughs> or whatever. I wasn't... Was it... Was it... Uh, what's his face? Uh, the other famous atheist who isn't Richard Dawkins. He's also British. Christopher Hitchens. Big brain. Um, didn't he say, like, because he was dying of, like, lung cancer or something. And then he was like, yeah, if I'm on my deathbed and I say that, you know... Uh, I, I say something about like believing in God or whatever, ignore me because I'm on so many drugs or whatever. Just ignore me. It's not true. I never will. I don't. But it's like, yeah, that like moment of like, that I've never been like close to death, but I have had one truly terrifying experience. And I was in a cable car and I'm sure everything was completely fine, but I was just sitting in this cable car going up this mountain in like some random place in China. And this cable car just starts. It's not like there's other. It's not like a big cable car with loads of people. It's just me and a couple of others, and we're in this cable car, and it just starts making these. Cr and we're over like a massive gorge, and it just starts from the like where the 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 cable car attaches the wire. It's just like going, <laughs> just making these crazy sounds, and I'm just like, it's the only time in my life where I've really like been. Am I in a dream? Is this a dream? Is this a nightmare? And I'm like pinching myself and I'm like, nope, this is reality. You're in a cable car that is making some crazy ass noises while you are fully over a gorge. And I'm like, oh Jesus, if you do exist, <laughs> save me. I know I've not been good. I don't believe in you. But no, do I believe in that stuff? No. But do I believe like in that like moment of like, oh, sh sure. I mean, I understand why it happens because you're like, well, not really anything I can do here. <laughs> Might as well pray. Everything's going to be okay. The gangsters of the late Bronze Age, the Sea Peoples, instilled terror in all those who happened to cross their path. They cut a swath of destruction across the Mediterranean and into the Near East, leaving nothing but devastation in their wake. But who were these enigmatic marauders? Were they merciless pirates, one of the horsemen announcing the end of the Bronze Age? Or were they victims of circumstance themselves? Well, let's find out. The Bronze Age Collapse On the shores of the Mediterranean, from present-day Greece all the way to the golden sands of Egypt, once rose a mighty global community, shining as brightly as the age that they're known for. The Bronze Age, lasting from 3300 BCE to 1200 BCE, was a time of advancement and prosperity that saw the rise of some of the greatest ancient empires, Mycenae and Minoa in Greece. The Great Hittite Empire, covering central Turkey, northwestern Syria, and upper Mesopotamia at its height. And in the south, the great and powerful Egypt, with its grand pyramids and the fertile Nile Delta, the shadow of its power reaching all the way to the southern tip of what we know today as Syria. The Late Bronze Age saw a time of relative peace with minor upheavals, with the great powers maintaining complex diplomatic relations and trade agreements. Cuneiform tablets found in the ruins of Agarit show a wealth of correspondence between the young and, sadly, last king of Ugarit, the last king of the Hittite Empire, and Pharaoh Menemta in Egypt, providing a rare glimpse into the workings of a truly global community. Perhaps not global by today's standards, but the globe was considered to be quite a bit smaller back then. Yeah, isn't that the thing with Alexander the Great? It's like he conquered the known world. And they're like, yeah, great one, Alexander. So you conquered basically a bit of stuff around the Mediterranean. I mean, I know it was, it was like different back then. How much did Alexander the Great actually conquer? It wasn't that much if you looked at the whole globe, but it was literally all anyone knew. 
The political systems of the day were based on royalty and an aristocratic class with social hierarchies that led to specialized professions and trade goods of outstanding quality. Copper and tin, the main components for bronze, were prized commodities. The various kingdoms and empires relied on their allies to supply them with whatever resources they lacked through trade. Advancements were made in art, architecture, technology, and warfare, with armies comprising of professional soldiers instead of bands of raiders or farmers defending their lands and homes with little more than pitchforks and a bit of enthusiasm. It was a prosperous time that benefited everybody, and then suddenly it all collapsed. Wait, were the sea people responsible for the collapse of the Bronze Age? Is that what they're famous for? Is that why it's so famous? I think that's right, right? That's kind of crazy. And if I remember, nobody knows who they are. So, what was the episode of this? Who were the sea people? I get the feeling we're not going to find out unless Ilza is uncovered something incredible that historians are now going to reference. Around 1250 BCE to 1150 BCE, the great Mediterranean civilizations came crashing down in quick succession. Researchers agree that it's unlikely that a single factor led to the Bronze Age collapse, and it's rare for academics to agree on anything. According to one researcher, Eric Klein, the Mediterranean civilizations faced a perfect storm of disasters. Localized disasters like earthquakes or volcanoes didn't just affect the immediate surroundings. Due to the close trade relations between the various powers, if one area was struck by a disaster, all those relying on it suffered as well. Other disasters, like a mega drought lasting from around 1250 to 1100 BCE, were more widespread and led to crop failures. Egypt's reliance on the Great Nile River was quite possibly its only saving grace. Crop failures and food shortages led to internal strife and upheaval as commoners set out to bring down the upper classes, high in their ivory towers with plenty of food, while the masses were starving. Malnutrition led to compromised immune systems, which led to disease, and with the peasants and slaves dying, no one was left to plant or harvest, leaving the fields bare. With one disaster striking after the other, without any time to recover, the great cities, and finally, the great empires, fell like dominoes. Into this chaos sailed the Sea Peoples. Okay, so it wasn't the Sea Peoples that caused this. All the was going down, and the Sea Peoples were like, Hello there! <laughs> it looks like you're ripe for the conquering! They were a mysterious seafaring group long considered to be one of the reasons for the Great Bronze Age collapse. They raided coastal cities, looting and plundering as they went, often leaving nothing but ruins in their wake. Oh, so they're not even conquering. They're just like, now nah, we're just going to take your s*** and leave. In the short span of around a hundred years, great cities were razed to the ground, once powerful civilizations fell never to recover, and the area witnessed death and devastation on an unknown scale. Those that survived the collapse were thrust into the Dark Age, where much of the writing system was lo were lost, since only 10% of the population could read or write and they didn't quite make it. Trade relations faltered, and the quality of life for your average citizen was greatly reduced. The glorious Bronze Age was over. The mysterious people from the sea. The Sea Peoples is a collective name for a loosely allied band of marauders that arrived on the scene when things started to fall apart, but we don't know much about them. The name Sea Peoples was given to the traveling band of bandits by French Egyptologist Gaston Maspero in 1881. Gaston's a good name, right? I know it's like super French or Gaston or whatever, but it's a good name. Gaston. However, the Sea Peoples is a bit of a misnomer. While many of them arrived in the Mediterranean by sea, there are also many descriptions of them arriving by wagons, so unless the wagons floated and the oxen swam through the Mediterranean, which would be quite a sight, they came across land as well, leading modern researchers to refer to them more accurately as the Land and Seas People. <laughs> well, that makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> it's also like, as opposed to? It's like, you know, uh, for indoor or outdoor use only. Right. Thank you. That's very helpful. <laughs> It works both ways. For a long time, the Sea Peoples was considered one of the causes of the Bronze Age collapse, but today they're considered to be a symptom of the time rather than a cause. Many reports of the Sea Peoples mention them traveling with their families and even livestock, which doesn't really fit the idea of pirates taking advantage of weakened kingdoms to loot and plunder. Instead, researchers believe that the disasters plaguing the Mediterranean led to mass migrations as desperate people fled their homes and set off with their families to find a better life elsewhere. That sounds like exactly what's happened. Rather than like, oh yeah, what caused the Bronze Age collapse? Well, all these people arrived and raided. It sounds like all of these disasters happened, right? And then somewhere in the disaster area are these land and sea peoples, and they're like, well, f this, we gotta get out of here and go somewhere else. And they go somewhere else and they do all their conquering and sh That just sounds like, there we go, mystery solved. That's, I mean, we still don't know who they are, but that sounds way more likely than it's like, what happens? They arrived on boats and destroyed civilizations. 
I mean, that's a better clickable thing and something perfect for the History Channel, but it doesn't really seem real, does it? Unfortunately, the Sea Peoples themselves never wrote anything down, or if they did, it has either been destroyed or it's still waiting to be found. Thus, all the records we have about this mysterious group were written by those they attacked, leaving us with subjective and biased accounts. Much of what we know about the Sea Peoples comes from the birthplace of meticulous record keeping. Egypt. According to Egyptian inscriptions, the Sea Peoples weren't a single group. It was a loosely allied group made up of about nine separate states or tribes the Shardana or Sherdan, depending on the translation, as well as Luka, Teresh, Ekwesh, Shekelesh, Peleset. <laughs> okay, so a bunch of groups with names that I'm definitely pronouncing wrong. And to be honest, could we pronounce them right anyway? Do people really know what ancient Egyptian sounded like? Is that one of those ones where it's like Latin? It's like there's not really correct pronunciations because people don't know how it sounded in the modern day. So I think I can get away with it, but I'm still not going to try. There's a bunch of groups of people grouped together, doing together, like allies. Haka Sherpa Sherpa, a bakala. Together, these tribes apparently formed an alliance to take out the great powers of the Near East and Mediterranean. The Egyptian reliefs of the Sea Peoples also give us a good idea of what they looked like, how they dressed, what weapons they used, and what kind of ships they traveled with. While this might seem like a wealth of information, it doesn't answer the most important questions, but we'll get to that in a bit. The first mention of tribes that would later become part of the Sea Peoples shows up in the records of Ramesses II. During the mid to late Bronze Age, Egypt was a kingdom to be reckoned with, governing an empire that extended north through Sinai, up the Palestine coast into Syria, and down the Nile into Nubia. During the fourth year of Ramesses II's reign, Sheridan pirates attacked the Egyptian delta. Ramesses II defeated them quite easily and incorporated the survivors into his own army, and they eventually became an important mercenary contingent. In around 1286 BCE, Ramesses II and the Hittites clashed at Kadesh over control of Syria, and both armies used mercenaries whose names would later appear on the list of tribes that made up the troublesome sea peoples. The Laka and Denyan fought on the side of the Hittites, while the Sheridan fought on the side of the Egyptians. To the great relief of everyone, the Egyptians and the Hittites signed a peace treaty in 1268 BCE, leading to a stable political setup in the Near East. The Sea Peoples show up again in Egypt around 1208 BCE, the fifth year of the reign of Pharaoh Menephtah, son of Ramesses II. Egypt was dealing with attacks from one of their oldest and fiercest enemies to the west, Libya. However, Libya wasn't standing alone. It had help in the form of allies only described as northerners which is a tad bit vague. It was a large battle for the ancient world, and by the end of it, over 6,000 Libyans and a 1,000 of their sea peoples lay dead. The victory steel, found in 1896 at the temple of Menepta in Thebes, tells the story of how Menepta heroically and wisely overwhelmed the enemy and even provides a list of tribes that allied with Libya. Uh, lots of them kind of unpronounceable. We're not sure why these tribes allied themselves with Libya and what their motivations were for attacking Egypt, but they were defeated, so clearly they chose to back the wrong horse. Thirty years later, the Sea Peoples were back again. Is this? It kind of feels like Sea Peoples is just what anyone refers to as generic outsiders from far away. You know, because they don't know any better. You've done well, my friend. Reliefs on the wall of Ramesses III Mortuary Temple in Medinet Habu, Thebes, describe the Battle of the Delta that took place around 1175 BCE between the forces of Egypt and Sea People invaders. The inscription on the outer wall of the second pylon is one of the longest hieroglyphic inscriptions ever found, suggesting it was a pretty important battle. Depictions of Egyptian galleys with their lion-hearted prows bravely facing off against the enemy galleys with bird's heads carved into the bow and stern tell the story of a great battle. The Battle of the Delta holds a special place in the annals of naval history, since it was the first ever described clash of fighting ships. Ramesses III first launched a defense across land, and the Egyptians, armed to the teeth, crushed the invading army. However, our wily pharaoh also realized that a second attack would come from the sea, as there were reports that the enemy ships were chilling off the coasts of Gaza. It's also one of those things that's like, yeah, 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 the pharaoh did that, the pharaoh did this. <laughs> How much of this do you not, do you think's actually true? Because it's like, this dude's just some Nepo baby. He's like just Ramesses the second son. I'm sure Ramesses was the Nepo baby of Ramesses the first. And it's like, how skilled do you think he was? He was probably just like really inbred and shit. And, but they're like, no, he's, he's basically God. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though all these brilliant military tacticians came up with that, it was the Pharaoh. It was always the Pharaoh. Everyone else must be forgotten. It was the Pharaoh. In carve it in his grave. In carve? That's not a word. Inscribe or carve. He was correct. Of course he was, that giant 
big brain Nepo baby. And when the invading fleet finally moved toward the mouth of the Nile, the Egyptian forces were ready and waiting for them. Ramesses III had everything that could float. Warship oh, I'm sorry, it was Ramesses III, so he's like Ramesses II's Nepo baby, who was the Nepo baby of Ramesses I. Look, I don't know how he this is <laughs> Royalty everywhere, Nepo babies. <laughs> He had them filled with valiant warriors and archers lying in wait. Along the shores of the Nile, archers were waiting in the papyrus reed beds to provide some additional firepower. The invaders, perhaps having grown overconfident with their many victories up and down the coast, crushing the Hittites, Cyprus, the city of Ugarit, as well as the kingdoms of Mycenae, sailed right into the trap with the archers on the riverbed raining down arrows forcing the enemy fleet forwards Ramesses ordered his ships to block the exit of the Nile trapping the invaders oh Ramesses you giant big brain I'm sure it was all you using grappling hooks to hold the vessels grappling hooks that he invented no I made that up but you know you get the drift the Egyptians boarded the sea people's ships slaughtering them the Battle of the Delta was a great victory for Ramesses III, as he finally managed to succeed where the other great kingdoms had failed. He slew the Denya, turned the Jekka and the Peleset into ashes, and changed the discord status of the Sherdan and Weshesh from playing civilizations to not available. <laughs> According to the great Harris Papyrus, named after Anthony Charles Harris, who discovered it in a tomb near Medinet Abbey, Ramesses III followed in the footsteps of his ancestor and also included the Sherdan as mercenaries in his great army, giving them land to settle with their wives and children. He provided them with jobs, and once they were settled, he taxed them to make sure they felt like they were a part of that great Egyptian family. Ah, yes, nothing to make you feel welcome like taxes. Nothing says welcome <laughs> like paying taxes. Yes! Ilza and I say page. However, there seems to be a bit of confusion on this point. Some sources claim that Ramesses II incorporated the Sherdan into his army, while others claim it was Ramesses III. However, other sources state that both pharaohs had the same idea. Unfortunately, I can't read hieroglyphics, so I can't check the primary sources. But once Duolingo launches a course on hieroglyphics, I'll get right on that. I So Duolingo is this, is this free app. I think it's free. Anyway, and it lets you learn another language. And I've messed around with Duolingo and to learn Czech. And I've just found it generally like, wow, I'm getting really good at this. Like, you get very good at Duolingo. It doesn't teach you to be very good at a language. It seems to just teach you to be very good at solving Duolingo puzzles. And it's like, as soon as you actually take that into the real world, you're like, oh no, not everyone is, is speaking in these neatly arranged sentences. And when I read things, it's not just about filling in random gaps. So, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of Duolingo. And then a friend of mine was like, dude, I've done like 900 days of Duolingo. And then I'll be like, and, and how's your check coming? And he's like, I don't know, but I've done 900 days of Duolingo. <laughs> it's like, dude, my check's better than yours. And I haven't learned it in two years. Three years! From the Egyptian inscriptions, it seems that while the Sea Peoples were wiping out the other great civilizations, Egypt had no problem dealing with these upstarts. The problem with Egyptian inscriptions is that the scribes writing them were more concerned with aesthetics, religion, and not getting executed by petty pharaohs rather than historical accuracy. If the inscriptions are to be believed, every exiting pharaoh left the country in chaos and it was up to the next pharaoh to step in and restore order. Oh, okay, so maybe after the... <laughs> I guess they're like, well, that god's dead, and we've got a new god now, so we have to talk about the old god, because finally he can't smite us. And... Which is interesting, because it also seems like all of this is like praising the pharaohs for being geniuses, when I, they're like probably inbred. So either Egypt was an incredibly unstable country, which would have made it hard to be big and prosperous as it was, or we need to take all of these dramatic accounts of pharaohs saving the day with a pinch of salt. It's definitely that. <laughs> it's definitely the latter. While our main source of information on the Sea Peoples is Egypt, the troublesome warriors are also mentioned in royal correspondence from Ugarit and Cyprus. According to these letters, the combined fleet of the Sea Peoples had massed off the southwestern tip of the Anatolian Peninsula from where they attacked the western coast of Cyprus. Battles also occurred on the Anatolian mainland, and the great king of the Hittite Empire had to turn to his allies, the port city of Ugarit in northern Syria, for extra troops and supplies to fight off the invading force. We really don't know where these dudes came from. It's like, so they're just all a bunch of like people who got together. But where from? However, Ugarit was itself under threat by the Sea Peoples. The young king of Ugarit wrote that the enemy ships had already landed, setting fire to the towns and doing great damage to the country. Since much of Ugarit's troops had already been sent to Hittite country to provide assistance, and many of their ships were stationed in Lycia, Ugarit was left poorly defended. 
Sadly, this cry for help never reached the Allies. In fact, it never left Ugarit. The clay tablet was found by archaeologists in a kiln waiting to be fired before being sent thousands of years later. <laughs> wow, they destroyed you real quick, didn't they? <laughs> I'm chiseling out this message calling for help. It didn't even get sent. It didn't even get essentially printed. It was just like some dude did it and it's like, that's it. Or like, I guess not chiseled out. If it was going in a kiln, what, you just like draw it with your fingers? <laughs> God, the past was sh Archaeological excavations of Ugarit provide a rare glimpse into the time of the Sea People's invasion. Ugarit, at the height of its power, was wiped off the map. Bronze arrowheads, ash from burnt buildings, and broken ceramics were all that remained. There's one more letter written by the scribes of the great king of the Hittites describing a victory on the side of the Hittite kingdom against the fearsome sea peoples, but it would be the last. Not long after this final victory, the Hittite kingdom fell before the marauders, and like all of those that came before, it was burnt to the ground, never to recover. Wow, these like, these sea peoples are like, what's that it, it called? I made a video about it on my War of Graphics channel. Scorched Earth. They're just like, yeah, take all your sh kill all your people and burn you to the ground. Why? Uh, why? Why not just keep the towns? <laughs> it seems so wasteful. Where did they come from and where did they go? Egyptian inscriptions usually describe the alliance of tribes as coming from the midst of the sea or from the islands, which is where the name Sea Peoples originally came from. Unfortunately, none of these records tell us exactly where these tribes called home. It's possible that their origins were common knowledge at the time since everybody knew where the Sea Peoples hailed from, so there was no need to write it down. We do know that the ancient Egyptians viewed the Sea Peoples as invaders, and we have the detailed list naming every tribe that made up the loose alliance today known as the Sea Peoples. So, as is often the case in cop shows, we have a name, but we don't have an address. However, most researchers seem to agree that they initially came from Asia Minor, the Aegean, the Balkans, and Cyprus. Boom! Mystery solved. Thanks for watching. <laughs> now nah, we're like halfway. However, where they came from is just one part of the mystery. Once the dust settled and the Bronze Age had bid farewell, most of the sea peoples themselves seemed to disappear along with it. But it's probably because they burned all the down. They were like, oh, now what are we going to eat? We burned and salted all the land. For the most part, researchers are relying on philology. What is that? The study of languages in historical sources was very specific to figure out where these tribes came from and where they ended up. But so far, we have nothing definitive to prove any particular theory. The Sea Peoples and Homer while we have written accounts of the Sea Peoples invading Egypt and wiping out Ugarit and the Hittite Kingdom, the role of the Sea Peoples in the fall of Mycenae is a little unclear. However, some theories suggest that at least some of the tribes that made up the Sea Peoples can be traced back to Mycenae. Based on archaeological finds, researchers believe that during the Middle of Bronze Age, Mycenae was dominated by an elite class focusing on production and trade. However, by the Late Bronze Age, this changed and the elite had been replaced by a warrior class. The Mycenaean Empire controlled the Aegean and Greece from separate city-states, depending on this strong warrior class for control. During this time, piracy became popular in the region, and according to... Th oh god... Th <laughs> <laughs> Idides? I bet this is one of those dudes, and if I was pronouncing it properly, I'd be like, oh yeah, I've heard of him, but I, I'm not. Thucydides? That could be it. Like, Th Thucydides? That sounds more familiar. An Athenian historian and general. At one stage, piracy was even considered honorable and a favorite pastime of the elite. Now that sounds kind of awesome. Is that what you're doing this weekend? Touch of piracy? <laughs> Just going out on my boats? <laughs> going to like plunder some gold? That's got to be the best part I've ever seen. However, piracy, like most shipping pursuits in the Mediterranean, was a seasonal thing, so how the elite entertained themselves out of season is a topic for another time. This shift from production and trade to warrior class engaging in piracy coincides with the decline and eventual destruction of Mycenae and other settlements in the Aegean. How much of this decline and destruction can be laid at the feet of the pirates is up for debate, but I'm fairly sure they had a hand in the resulting chaos. In fact, many settlements relocated to more defensible positions further away from the coast, both inland and on coastal hilltops probably because of a new more serious threat coming at them from the waves this trend of relocation and piracy wasn't restricted to the greek mainland and surrounding islands similar population movements also occurred in etruria today known as italy despite being a great civilization the mycenaean city-states didn't actually need any outside enemies 
the piracy wasn't the only problem. The city-states themselves were often at each other's throats. This constant warfare between the various city-states, along with other disasters, greatly weakened the Mycenaean civilization, making them ripe for the taking, and the Sea Peoples were happy to oblige. However, at the end of the day, we don't know if the Sea Peoples had anything to do with the fall of Mycenae. It's entirely possible that the ancient Greeks destroyed themselves with a helping hand from, the ra- from a wrathful god and a volcano or two. This was interesting, right? Like, over history, civilizations have been destroyed and it, you can't I, like, I live in a civilization like we all live in a civilization like this whole modern global thing that we've got going on and it's like with this come pretty close to destruction in like twice in the last hundred or so years and i'm like that's kind of nuts it's like how and now we can destroy ourselves really easily with like big bombs and stuff so it's like how much longer is our civilization going to go on for because before we reset it and have to go back and you know I don't know. Like, it's interesting, isn't it? Like, nothing's nothing's forever. It's all gonna change eventually, like, over a big enough time frame. It's kind of depressing, isn't it? I mean, I'll be long dead, fortunately. <laughs> in Homer's... I mean, I hope so. Like, I hope civilization doesn't collapse in my lifetime. That'd be a bit miserable. But now having kids, I'm like, oh, man, I hope civilization doesn't collapse in my kids' lifetime. And then when I have gan- grandkids, I'll probably feel the same way, although slightly less so. Which is weird, isn't it? Like, because I'm like, mm, I'm getting on in my years now. It's like, mm, I don't see there's a possibility, like, I'm going to get drafted into a war. I'd say that's fairly unlikely. When I was a kid, I was kind of like, man, there were wars in the past. Like, studying history, I'd be like, god damn, there was, like, two major wars, like, within my grandparents' lifetime, where people were getting drafted and having to go and work in the trenches and get shot. And I'm like, that sounds bad. And I was kind of like, that could happen again. And then I'd have to go off and fight in a war, which would be rubbish. And now I've got kids, I'm like, it all resets because I'm like, God damn! I really hope there's not another, there's a, not a war within the like next thirty years or whatever. Because then they'll they'll have to go off and fight in a war. And I'm like, that's rubbish. <laughs> when do you stop getting drafted? I'm thirty six. How many more years do I have to wait before I'm safe <laughs> from getting drafted? And then I suppose it depends how bad the war goes, right? Because at some point you could be like Russia, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah no, we need sixty year olds. <laughs> Or whatever and it's like oh what are they doing oh they're they're at the front lines because they're the most disposable and it's like no <laughs> i don't want that god i hope there's no war in homer's tale odysseus claims to have launched his raids from crete and describes a similar tactic used by raiding parties attacking the hittite kingdom from a captured port in cyprus traveling in small groups instead of large fleets to ensure stealth and speed the raiders would often beach their vessels allowing warriors to disembark and raid quickly thus preventing their chosen target from mounting a proper defense how else would they do it <laughs> what are you gonna do just like anchor your boat offshore and be like all right everyone get into the get into the smaller boats and row ashore real slowly in vulnerable small groups or worse yet just swim <laughs> surely beaching seems to be the only sensible way to do an invasion depictions of helletic oared galleys show keel extensions that made this beaching tactic possible similar keel extensions can be seen on sea people's vessels in the depiction of the battle of the delta in hieroglyphics at medina tabu further suggesting a link to mycenae according to inscriptions on the tanis steel commissioned by ramesses ii the sherdan had been raiding coastal settlements including egypt for several years if the sherdan raids were seasonal as was the case with most shipping endeavors at the time they could possibly have been raiding for nine years coinciding with Odysseus's claim of leading nine raids. When Ramesses II finally defeated and captured this troublesome foe, he chose to welcome them into Egypt and made them part of Egyptian society instead of throwing them in prisons or using them as slave labor. <laughs> How generous of him. I, mean, I don't know why I said that sarcastically. It's really generous. <laughs> I don't know. There was no reason to say that sarcastically. It's like, that's really nice that he's like, in, <laughs> he didn't make them slaves. <laughs> Ramesses II, good guy. By the fifth year of the reign of Ramesses II, the Sherdan already made up part of the pharaoh's bodyguard and assisted him with a battle against the Hittite army. By the reign of Ramesses V, as seen in the Wilbur Papyrus, a land registry, the Sherdan were landowners and they could pass down land from one generation to the next. In keeping with the story of the Sherdan, in Homer's work, Odysseus claims that after his defeat, he lived and worked in Egypt, accumulating some wealth. So if we consider the parallels between the two stories, I suppose it's possible that the Sherdan, at least, possibly came from Mycenae and finally settled in Egypt. However, some sources say that they ended up in Sardinia. This is the problem with the past. It's like, yeah, yeah, maybe this, maybe that. Maybe we could just rely on this book, which might be fiction. Who knows? 
historians in the past weren't so much concerned with like history they seem to be more concerned with like let's tell a good story the sherdan might not have been the only tribe hailing from ancient greece according to researchers the inscriptions of pharaoh menepta could point to the equish tribe also originating from greece the equish is only mentioned once by menepta and they showed up in egypt after the trojan war for the sake of this script we'll assume it was an actual battle and debate the historical accuracy of homer and the existence of giant wooden horses another day some yeah that's what i'm saying it's like yeah maybe history maybe just a story who knows some modern scholars believe that equesh was the egyptian pronunciation for acha oi an ancient <laughs> it's quite different isn't it an ancient word for achaeans the name for the mycenaean era greeks this theory suggests that the Equus tribe were the remnants of the Trojan War, a band of renegades that first besieged and sacked Troy, and once that was done, hopped on their ships and set off for Egypt to repeat the exercise. Wait, who was who? It doesn't matter. Like, I'm not sure. I've got a little bit confused with all of these like random tribes and stuff, but it seems like historians are also confused, so we're just going to assume that that's okay. Of course, that didn't end well for them. Perhaps staying on their own side of the Mediterranean would have been a safer bet. Were the Philistines originally the Sea Peoples? However, the Sherdan and Equish aren't the only tribes considered to have roots in ancient Greece. Another tribe theorized to possibly originate from the area is the Peleset. According to inscriptions by Ramesses III, he took the Peleset captive after the battle in the Nile Delta and had all the leaders of the tribe killed. Whether this is fact or just boasting is unclear. Some researchers are of the opinion that Peleset was settled in modern-day Palestine and is better known today as the Philistines from the Bible. All of this is just like, yeah, someone thinks this, someone thinks that. Ancient history, so much guessing. Maybe we can also rely on the Bible for some historical facts. The Bible states that the Philistines originally came from Kaftor, which some historians have identified as ancient Crete. However, Cyprus, the islands of the Aegean, or even Cappadocia in Asia Minor, have also been suggested as being the ancient city of Kaftor. The Philistines settled in Palestine and is often associated with five city-states. The writers of the Bible clearly considered the Philistines as a foreign group arriving in Canaan from distant shores. Unfortunately, the Bible is a bit of a problematic source historically. <laughs> Yeah, no sh <laughs> That Old Testament section especially is like, and then they were in a garden. Oh, they were, were they? Oh, and then he ate a rib or something like that. Sounds real. I know the Old Testament's not really real, but the New Testament's also like historically well dodgy. However, the archaeological record supports the idea that the Philistines were a more urbanized group hailing from elsewhere. Archaeological excavations have uncovered pottery shards, which are useful for establishing a timeline. In the 12th century, around the time the Sea People raided, a style of pottery shows up in the cities occupied by the Philistines, showing similarities to Mycenaean pottery. Later pottery show local influences, but the basic shapes are still reminiscent of shapes found in the Aegean and Cyprus. The pottery was used along with Canaanite pottery and shows that the two groups inhabiting the area coexisted relatively peacefully. Fish motifs also put in an appearance, suggesting that while the Philistines in the time of the Bible were an inland people, their roots were most likely closer to the sea. Similar designs have also been found in the Aegean, Cyprus, and Western Anatolia, further indicating a link between the Philistines and ancient Greece. However, genetic testing of the remains of ten biblical Philistines uncovered at an Iron Age cemetery in ancient port city of Ashkelon showed that these ten individuals had a genetic component from southern Europe. It's impossible to say whether they were part of the Sea Peoples, but it does suggest at least 10 people originally came from Crete or the Greek mainland. DNA testing on animal bones has also revealed that European pigs were introduced to the region in significant numbers in the early Iron Age. It's unclear whether they were specifically Greek pigs, but it certainly suggests a European origin for the Philistines. Based on archaeological finding, it seems the Philistines settled the area peacefully, so they were probably given the land freely. The Philistines and Canaanites coexisted, and Philistine cities weren't fortified until much later. The new arrivals were also allowed to settle some of the most fertile lands in Canaan, further supporting the idea that they were there with permission from their Egyptian overlords. Why Ramesses III would have given land to people that just attacked him is a bit of a mystery, though Mycenae was a political ally of Egypt, so if Peleset did originate in Mycenae and were desperate people fleeing bad circumstances back home, perhaps they were given land based on past allegiances. While there's nothing indicating this in the records, I also have to wonder if perhaps the Peleset tribe, upon realizing that things really weren't going their way in the Nile Delta, switched sides and were rewarded for this betrayal. However, don't quote me on that, it's just the musings of a writer. Of course, not everyone agrees. Some theorize that the Peleset were Anatolians who influenced the ancient Greeks, or that the Peleset originated in the Levant and only used Crete as a port of trade, suggesting that the Levant influenced Greece and not the other way around. Unfortunately, there are no Sea Peoples around to ask. So for now, the Philistines originally being Sea Peoples is just another interesting theory. 
Of course, as the sea people lay waste to great empire after great empire, hundreds or even thousands of people would suddenly be left homeless. This displaced population very likely ended up joining the marauders, looking for a new place to settle, further increasing their number by so, so by the end of the late Bronze Age and their final defeat in Egypt, the Sea Peoples was a truly cosmopolitan community representing every great city in the Mediterranean. The big question, why? When the Sea Peoples arrived on the scene, the world was already going to hell in a handbasket, so why add to the misery? What was their motivation for going on an offensive and raiding so extensively along the Mediterranean coast? As I mentioned before, the disasters plaguing the Mediterranean quite possibly affected large parts of Europe as well. Researchers have found that during the late Bronze Age, food shortages were quite rampant in Anatolia. The Hittites could import grain and other goods from Egypt and Canaan, relieving some of the burdens brought on by droughts and other environmental factors. However, the people of western and northern Anatolia weren't part of the Hittite Empire. On top of that, they were also often at war with both the Hittites and the Mycenaean Empire. While the main motivation for many of the tribes might have been as simple as finding food, other groups might have joined out of greed, as is often the case in situations like these. Desperate people seeking better lands and opportunities gave a small group an excuse to loot and plunder, building wealth by taking down the once powerful kingdoms. Soon the various groups probably realized they had some enemies and perhaps even some allies in common, and a loose alliance formed. Yeah, that seems totally reasonable. It's like, why would people make it worse? Because people will take advantage and they'll kick someone when they're down and take all their Combining their land and sea forces, the Sea Peoples were able to destroy Ugarit, essentially severing the wheat pipeline from Egypt to the Hittite lands. With the flow of wheat from Egypt cut off, the Hittite Empire fell not long after. With the Hittite lands in ruins, the Sea Peoples, though most of them were possibly traveling by land by now, could freely flow across the Hittite lands with their families and belongings on wagons to reach their final goal, Canaan. The only thing in their way now was Phoenicia, but they bypassed Phoenicia, heading straight to Canaan, destroying whatever other cities they encountered, and finally settled down once they found more fertile lands to provide them for themselves and their families. Some continued to Egypt, where they finally ran afoul of Ramesses III at the Nile Delta, and well, we know how that went. However, while this is a great theory, it's just pure speculation. The only thing we know for sure is that the Sea Peoples attacked coastal cities of the Hittite Empire, Ugarit, and Egypt. They might have raided along the coast of Mycenae, but we're not actually sure. And as for why they did it, we have no idea. It's a really good theory, though, that there was lots of going down. They were like, let's go somewhere else. Along the way, people joined them, and they started raiding just to survive. And at some point, they got beaten. Lots of stuff got burned down. Boom. Done. Easy. Generic group of people. Conclusion We don't know where the Sea Peoples came from or why they attacked the great empires of the day. We also don't know for sure what happened to them after the Bronze Age collapse. As far as mysteries go, it doesn't appear that we've decoded anything at all. Well, don't worry, Ilza. Neither of historians. <laughs> However, despite being a very mysterious group, the impact of the Sea Peoples on history is quite impressive. It's likely that the empires would have fallen anyway, but the addition of the Sea Peoples raiding along the coast, leaving only ruins in their wake, made the destruction of these once great empires quite final. The Hittite civilization, which thrived in Anatolia for around a thousand years, was so completely annihilated that it vanished from history until it was rediscovered thousands of years later. Egypt may have won a decisive victory in the Nile Delta that fateful day, but lost much of its territory in Syria, Palestine, and even Nubia. The once powerful Egypt was greatly weakened, and many historians consider the 20th dynasty to be the end of the New Kingdom and the Egyptian and Egyptian domination. Egypt will never again lead an international global community in terms of politics and culture. Pirates plundering for wealth and treasure, or desperate people fleeing their homes looking for food and shelter in foreign lands, will probably never know. Until we find something written by the Sea Peoples themselves, we only have the word of their enemies to describe them. And that's where we end today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. Hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed the show, leave a review a rating on Spotify, and thanks for being here.